sitting at lovely 15 Perry Street. This is Robert Gowan. You're listening to Mentors for Military, and I'm glad you guys are uh, tuning in. Uh, be sure to follow us on all those social media with Mentors, the number four MIL, as well as check out our Patreon site if you want to help support the podcast. I'm sitting here with a guest that I've looked so forward to actually having on the show. Um, I read the book, and I'm going to talk a lot about it. And um, Well, first off, my guest is Larry Freeland, the author of Chariots in the Sky, and so glad to have you here. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. Look forward to chatting because uh, they have lost one or two planes, but they've overloaded them with military guys. Uh, not, I don't know about then, but I've, uh, I've seen some uh, uh, stories about that in, in uh, documentaries about uh, overloading and then just can't get off the runway, and then, and then we have an accident. But I wasn't thinking that, but I kept thinking, boy, we're running out of runway here because I could see the light. And the light. Forget the color codes, but we hit the last <laughs> color code that you had to be off wheels up, and we weren't wheels up yet. Uh, oh, God, I haven't even left the country, and I'm going to die. <laughs> 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 uh, it's funny now, it wasn't then, but we, we got up, and we flew over to Alaska, got out for a couple hours, and then we flew from there to uh, Japan, and then we flew from there to uh, Tonsonut outside of Saigon. And when we got in airspace over Saigon, we were at altitude. The pilot comes on. He says, oh, gentlemen, you're in your new home for whatever period of time. He said, if you want, you can look out the right or left, and you can see it. We're at about whatever it was, 20, 30,000 feet up. He said, we were going into the uh, holding pattern, and we've been instructed that the uh, Tonsonut is under uh, rocket attack. So <laughs> when, we get, <laughs> when we get clearance, uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to go down fast. Uh, and... Uh, roll up and they're going to open the come guys are going to come in and open the doors and they're going to hustle you out put you in the uh in appropriate areas sure enough when he said okay here we go guys and the you know, next thing you know, he's just falling right out of the sky and we landed and they taxied over all the doors opened up and all of a sudden we're comfortable and when all the doors opened up the heat the humidity the smell it all just goes poof. You wow. Go, oh my God, I'm in Vietnam. <laughs> I probably just about everybody went there. If not everybody, we remember a lot of things, and that was probably one of them. And they yelled a few things at us, and they had us going out both sides, uh, in the front and the back, and down the ramps, and hustled us into a big uh, uh, hangar. Mm -hmm. And this hangar was huge. It didn't have aircraft. It was just processing hangar. And down the middle of it, like this, was a rope line. And on this side, we were hustled in on this side, and on this side was all the guys going home on the plane we just got off. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, we were all lost and tired and, you know, and everything else. And a lot of these, well, not a lot, but some of these guys would come over the line and they were taunting us, oh, it's a new guy, you know, I'm loving a guy, you know, you're going to love it here, you know, I'm glad <laughs> to get out. And some of these guys looked like they'd just come out of the bush. I mean, they were really, just, some of them were really pretty ragged. And you go, oh my gosh, I know I'm here now in between the weather and this and all that. So anyway, we were there and uh, we were there a couple of days and I got signed. Uh, and this was like January the, you know, we just get on about, it's about January the 5th or the 6th um, that we actually got there. And we were taken across Tonsonute to an army holding uh, depot where we would stay for a couple of days until they gave us our orders to go to whatever unit we yeah. were going to. At the time, we didn't know it. There were some other pilots in, in the group I went with. Uh, but all the pilots, uh, we were told later on, uh, which certainly included us, were being assigned up north to I Corps, up near the DMZ, to the 101st Airborne. We didn't know, but there was a big operation that's in that book, Lamson, being, being planned and ultimately be kicked off, and they were going to need all the pilots they could get up in that region. So uh, I thought since I was going into you know, another Army surprise, oh, I'm going to Tonsonut, it's quiet down there in I Corps, it's the rice paddies, and the war's winding down, which it was. Nixon had started the... Uh, Vietnamization program at that point, and it was slowly picking up steam. And we all came down on orders to join the 101st, and everybody's like, where are they at? Well, those guys are still fighting, and they're up there in the i Corps uh, in Hyashaw Valley, and Fubai, and uh, DMZ, and Quang Tree, and yeah, they're, they're an active unit. They were one of the best units over there, and of course, guys are gonna get mad at that, but they were one of the, they were, they were a good unit. There were many good units, probably all of them, but uh, they had, at that time of the war in 1971, they were still actually going out looking for bad guys, where a lot of units were standing down, getting ready to go home and turn it over. Uh, these guys were still looking for a fight, um, and, and they <coughs> could find it if they wanted to. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, we were going up there, and boy, you talk about being dejected. Let's see, I get drafted. I can't get. I can't go to flight school. <laughs> I go to the infantry. Now I'm a pilot, and now I'm over here, and they're sending me the hundred and first. Okay, can it get any better? Well, yeah, it did. Lumps on. <laughs> <laughs> Just didn't know it yet. 
So uh, ended up up there, um, flew in the middle of the night, and they, they trucked us up to a place outside of, we landed at Fubai, which is right next to Way, and that was the main operational area for the 101st. Um, and it was situated between the uh, coastline, flatlands, and then you got into some hills, and then you got into the mountains, and the Asheville Valley was all along those mountains up to the DMZ. Um, so we were there, flew in there that night, and then I don't know what time it was, but they loaded us all into these deuce and halves, and they trucked us through uh, Fubai and Way, and on the other side of Way to Camp Evans, which was uh, the 101st uh, fire base, a big one. Um, you had Fubai, and then you had Camp Eagle, which was uh, where the general and his staff and some infantry units were, and then you had Evans, which was north of Way, and it was the furthest most big base that they had at the time. And they, sh they shipped us up there and, and put us in, in barracks, and it was, you know, you were, you were in on then, and you were out there where uh, you were potentially uh, could be shot at or whatever, but it was pretty quiet. Uh, and I said, what in, the, what in the heck am I doing here? I'm a pilot. Why am I my unit? You know, and the other guys, the other fellows were piloting. Well, the, the uh, 101st has this uh, program called CERTS, Screaming Eagles Replacement Training School. And everybody that comes into country goes to CERTS for a week, and then they go to their unit. I said, my God, it never ends. <laughs> <laughs> when people see those, and I, and I'm speaking for myself now, like platoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, platoon is what reactivated me to... Uh, pursue trying to tell the story I carried. When I came back, I put everything away, threw it away, or gave it away, and didn't. Most you know, do compressed. Yeah. You know, they compress it. You know, yeah. and try to push it away. But I thought in the back of my mind, I always carried this uh, idea of I'm a big movie guy mm -hmm. uh, since I was a little boy, and I thought you know someday maybe they'll write a movie about or produce a movie about the helicopter aspect because it was iconic to the war, but. And I hadn't been wanting to do with it back then, so I buried all that stuff. I had trouble for the first couple of years, but uh, I pretty much managed to bury it. And I saw a platoon when I was 86, walked out of that theater, Linda and I did, and walked out of that theater, and I looked over at her, and I thought, Linda, I said, I just came back from Vietnam a second time. I mean, it wow. just really woke stuff up. And sometime after that, it, it got me thinking, well, that was about the ground infantry fellows. Uh, what about a movie about... Uh, Helicopter pot. So long and the short of it, I wrote a letter to the Stone. I knew that he had produced that one, had a second one at that time in production or post-production, uh, which was born on the 4th of July. Didn't know it at that time, but, <clears throat> and that he was supposedly going to do a trilogy, a third one about Nam. Oh, well, that trilogy, a third one, maybe it'll do a helicopter one. So I wrote him this letter, query letter and uh, sent it out that I had an idea about it and gave him a little storyline. And it was two, three, four weeks later, I get a letter from the guy. And uh, he said, well, you know, I, I am in post, I guess it was post-production of uh, my next movie. He didn't name it at the time. He says, it's coming out pretty soon. And I have a third storyline concept that I'm going to go, and it, it doesn't involve helicopters. He said, but you got a great idea, and I agree with you. He said, uh, you know, what you might want to do is write a book about it and or, you know, write a screenplay. And if you don't know how to write one, he said, uh, hook up with some screenwriter screenwriters and see what you can come up with and then you know see if you can get an agent or, or market it yourself and uh he said it's you know it's a tough road to hoe and i but he says i think it's a great story that you potentially have there so then he gave me some suggestions and some context and make a list of sure i took all that i put it aside for about a year or so and then i thought you know i'm gonna give it a shot so i went out and I read some books about screenplay i read I uh, bought uh, Bugsy, the screenplay that Warren Beatty had written, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I was told that's a, a good one to learn from. I read it twice. Oh, yeah, this is, you know. So anyway, I sat down and I wrote a screenplay, um, <clears throat> and it was called The Flying Pachyderms. My unit was Pachyderms, but it was still about Huey uh, Salt Pilots, uh, and, and it all centered around Lomson at the time. And I wrote it, and then I passed it around for a good while, and people were all coming back with suggestions and everything, but, and making it better. Uh, but everybody said, you know, Larry, this would make a great book. You could really dive into some of these people and make it uh, probably more interesting than, you, than, uh, than a screenplay. And, and they all suggested, if, you know, if this don't work, write a book. And I'm talking to a lot of people over a period of time. And when it was all, uh, and I thought, okay, I'm well, fine, but I'm kind of tired and I want to see this in a movie, you know. What do I know? It's, I'm not in the movie business, but what the heck. Uh, so anyway, I, uh, I decided to... Uh, market it myself and I wrote a query letter to 10 production companies out in Hollywood and uh, that would have been in uh, the early 90s 92 or 93 on well, prior to that I'd entered it in a screenwriting contest here in, um, in uh, Atlanta 
Georgia. It's called the Southeast Screenwriters Contest down in Atlanta. And it won one honorable mention with some good comments. Not some were, you know, you know, but the others were really nice and they got honorable mention. I thought, well, gee, maybe an agent will pick me up and I'm on my way. Most people don't know that Georgia is like a second L.A. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of movies that are actually filmed here. We have studios right down the road here. And, and, a lot uh, of production. In this a lot state. of production, yeah. Not much. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of people who have read my book after they read it just come and say, paraphrasing, Geez, I had no idea. I, I, I don't know. How'd you do that? I mean, yeah. how are you even here? So, uh, you know, there's some really dramatic stuff. That I, I want to get into one of those, if you don't mind. Okay. If this would be a good lead in. Um, because, well, there's a couple of things. And you mentioned it very early on about how there were Hilo pilots and then there was Chinook. And, you know, you ended up going to Chinook, but you took some of the stories of other pilots and stuff and incorporated it in them. The Lolo ground action uh, mm -hmm. chapter of chapter 15, how much of that was actually real before I get, in, get more into that? Well, a couple things. Uh, Lolo was, was a real fire base and a real action. The first day, it was in March, and I don't remember the exact date, and the fellows out there that might hear this that know more know about it, it was the 3rd or the 4th or the 5th of March, the, the helicopter assault units, Huey units that were tasked with getting the Arvin in to set up the base initially and secure that that hilltop, if you will, or that ridge line, Lolo. They took the most extensive uh, losses in one day ever recorded in aviation history for the Army. Before that or after that, uh, they lost uh, 11 Hueys. That mm. day, 11. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, some, guy, some fellows didn't make it back alive. And of course, some were wounded. Uh, and then at some point, it's a little fuzzy, but over the next couple of days, they were able to get enough people in to, to basically secure the area, and then they brought in the Chinooks, uh, probably the next day, uh, to bring in the supplies that we could get them in there. Same, same LZs? Now, same LZ, Lolo. Get in there, bring them in water blivets, bring them in ammunition, bring in their 105s, ammunition for 105, I building no supplies. Idea. Uh, you know, uh, sandbags and so on and so forth. And we would do sling loads. You've seen the schnooks mm -hmm. where they can, mm -hmm. they're pretty powerful. We could do usually two slings, sometimes three, depending on how heavy and what we were lifting and, and what we were taking in. Uh, but we were tasked with, uh, I was in the, what was the 101st Airborne Division, the 159th Aviation Battalion, three Chinook companies, A, B, and C. Each had 16 uh, Chinooks. They didn't all function or fly at the same time. <laughs> uh, and I make a point in the book about that. Uh, but, uh, and we, we didn't, uh, at least A Company, I went to A Company, the Bacoderms. Uh, and when I, was, when I got there, uh, we didn't have a full contingent of pilots. And people were rotating in and rotating out. And that's why they're trying to send everybody they could up to the 101st. So we had enough to meet our obligations, I guess. I wasn't in charge of operations at that time. But, um, you know, we, we uh, were in it from the beginning. Back to Lolo. Um, we went in... I don't know which companies went first. When it was our turn, I was in line. I was second or third behind the first time I went in there. Uh, um, the guys in our company usually took in maybe three, four, five Chinooks, and we'd be spaced way out. And we'd go in at altitude. We'd go in at five, six, seven thousand feet uh, because it was pretty rough by then. When Lola was put in about three weeks into the operation, and it had already gone to hell in a handbasket every fire base. So it was intense the whole time when you crossed the border in Laos. Into Laos, I think I've pointed out in the book, and you, we thought, you know, you got a 50-50 chance of coming back alive. That's how bad it was. Uh, but <clears throat> anyway, we, when it was our turn to go in, we were at altitude, and this is my first time in, and, I, and uh, we, get, we got over it, and <laughs> we did a maneuver that, as a Chinook, uh, we didn't learn prior to being in Vietnam. And I think some of the guys had learned it the previous year when they were trying to get in and out of the ash shell, rip cord and places like that, they were under fire. And they may have learned this technique there. I, I don't know. But the guy, the, our, our company, when the, the lead ship where it was flying, got to the point where he needed to go down to the base, if, if this was the fire base and we'd be coming in like that, he'd see it and he'd get over the base and we'd be five, six, seven thousand feet up above everything they were being shot at down on the ground. And he would just push the cyclic forward into about 25, 30 degree angle downward, drop the thrust rod and just fall out of the sky. And we, we would just spiral down. 
And no you, way. Yeah, and you're 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 fighting the fighting the wrong. You're controlling the controls, or the best you can, trying to keep the rotor blades from going in the red line and literally possibly flying right out of their holdings up there. So you're you're constantly uh, fighting the controls to some extent to keep it from shaking apart. But you want to get down fast. And you want to get down straight. straight. Is that why? Yeah, you want to get down at least in this case because uh, they uh, the faster you were falling. Uh, the less chance you would get hit. But when you got close, 1,000 AGL above ground or a little less, it didn't really matter. That's the time you started fighting the controls to level, try and level off, slow down, and set up your final little approach into the base. Uh, so it was a free fault. You got low, get it under control, get it, flare it, punch your button, drop it, and get out, pull your thrust rod, and just do an elevator takeoff and get the, get the hell out of there. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Uh, we we went in the first time. Did you do troop loads as well uh, on the for, Chinook? Uh, not in, not in hot LZs. No. Okay. Too many guys could be lost if they got if they went down. Sure. We just did externals in okay. hot LZs. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, everything in Laos for us, to my knowledge, at least that I flew or flew in groups with, we it was always sling loads inside Laos. When we get back to Quezon, you know, we could take internals and externals and. Because uh, as that operation went into the second month, I digress again, but uh, we were, as Chinooks, we were taking back wounded Arvins from Quezon area, some of the helipads in the main base, back to Quang Tri on the coast for better medical attention and ultimately moving them down south to, to do what they need to do for them. And we'd put 25, 30 of them on a, on a Chinook and, and on their stretchers and ferry them back. So uh, that's, that was an internal. But uh, no, not in Laos, it's all external. But coming into there, we first guy got all shot up, got out of there. <clears throat> Second guy got all shot up, got out of there. <laughs> Third guy, being me, got all shot up and got out of there. And then they called it off. We were taking too many hits, and we all limped back to Quezon and reassessed the situation. Another time, I don't remember which mission it was into that place because I ended up going in there a couple times over a week or so. At least in time is a little, and that's one of the missions that's you know, portrayed a little bit in there. Um, I went in and um, we got hit down the left side of the helicopter uh, by small arms machine gun fire as we were gotten real close. And the guy flying in the left seat got hit with it. We got hit in the front with the tracers. And uh, when they exploded, a whole bunch of smoke came into the cockpit mm. and little particles got in, of plexiglass got embedded in the smoke. And uh, the fellow flying with me, got, he, got, he got a lot of shrapnel. Our left door gunner got hit in the head, and uh, we, uh, my crew chief, uh, we lost AC control of the of the rotor blades. Uh, the instruments were all shot up. There's bullet holes all down the left side, and it was a little hectic there for a while. But um, I managed to stabilize it, punched off the load before we got down any further, and tried to stabilize to you know, get the hell out of there quick. And uh, the crew chief, uh, he, he pulled the pilot out and put him in the back, and the other gunner worked on him because. The left, guard, the left door gun was gone. <clears throat> and uh, he helped me fly back. And it was tough. It was tough because, and we made a running landing at uh, Quezon and, uh, you know, and just sat there at the controls, just going, oh, I mean, I could have, I took a sweat bath. You know, you just, you just, you don't have, at least in my case, uh, when that happened, it was all in slow motion. It, it, you had, uh, you didn't have time to think about it, you just had to react. And that's where your training comes in. Training. Yeah. You know, you may joke as a young guy in the early part of your training, but that is serious stuff if you're going to be in a combat uh, role. Because when that kicks in, it's all autopilot for you. And without that, you know, you know, you probably make a lot of mistakes or may not make it. But that all kicked in, and I just luckily was able to stay in focus enough. And I don't want to name his name, but the crew chief uh, did a wonderful job helping me. See, in a Chinook, you have AC and DC control of the rotor blades. And DC is battery driven. There's a bunch of toggles down there on the main console between the two seats. AC, it's automatically controlled like uh, anything would be on autopilot. And uh, when that's shot out, you've got to manually <coughs> control the two engines or the two blades to keep a certain speed of, with, with uh, the blades. And uh, he was doing that because uh, without that, it, I couldn't do everything else and do that too. <laughs> At least I didn't think I could, and uh, he helped. He helped manage that, and along with some other things, monitor what instruments we had left and things. And and we got back uh, and uh, landed. And back then, you got all the 24 hours off <laughs> if you could still walk and talk and didn't have any bullet holes. 
in my case in that, I got a lot of little pe- plexiglass particles that were embedded in that smoke. Mm-hmm. It's just like it was like having sand thrown in your eyes. And uh, I think I've got a yeah, story. Yeah, you do have you do have a story in here about mm-hmm. that exactly mm-hmm. what you just described. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it was getting worse as I got closer. I was able to get down, and I mean, I could see, but it was it was, it was you know, really. And uh, the medics got to me, and they flushed my eyes out with a bunch of water. I was medevaced at Da Nang, and I was down there a couple of days, and they flushed it out and everything, and uh, was back on back in duty. And within two or three days, I didn't have any damage. I just had to get all those little particles flushed out. Uh, so that was my second or third time in there. And I had some other close calls too, but yeah, I thought that was a pretty interesting story to potentially embed in there somewhere. And uh, I wanted it to have some semblance of historical uh, accuracy and effect, and uh, fact. When when you read this book and you like me, you get transported to a different place. Um, what you guys were experiencing in these hot LZs, the chaos. Um, I mean, the rounds hitting the aircraft and making it sound like popcorn. The descriptions that were going on there, the amount of tracer fire, uh, tracer rounds that were going by, RPGs that were just missing you by inches or, you know, whatever the case may be. And in these cases, there were, um, there were multiple waves of Hueys that were coming in trying to drop in the troops. And usually the first wave seemed to be relatively safe, it seemed like, every time I read um, each one of the LZ. So each story that you guys came in and you guys did this over and over, which I'll touch on in a minute, but it seemed like the first wave would come in and they would take notice of, oh, all right, we've got transport coming in. Um, so the first one, you were good. If you were in the second wave, God help you. If you were in the third wave, <laughs> holy cow. Yeah, that's the way they work. They figure if, they, if we put some guys on the ground on the first wave, we had committed. And we would do what we could to get them out or supply them. And they knew that. Uh, no man left behind kind of thing. Yeah. That was pretty much their scenario. That wasn't to say a first guy's in might not get shot at occasionally or, or even come under a heavy attack. But normally it was kind of, I won't say quiet, but, uh, you know, suck us in and then give us hell. <laughs> but it also makes you wonder just how much information gets passed. Well, that's a good question. And um, t- there's a good story there. I want I, I cannot <laughs> I spent a year there, but I still can't pronounce uh, Vietnamese names very well. But they had a high level spy in Saigon during the whole war. His, his agent number was C Z twenty one and he was known as Pham Zun An. And he uh, he he had access to uh, MACV headquarters. He was a reporter kind of a guy and he was doing all kinds of reporting, so he had access to a lot of people. Uh, and he had worked his way in and created a huge network down there within MACV and, and, and in other places. And for years, he would be passing information through their chain, which was a marv- marvelous is the wrong word, but a very intricate way of getting messages through the south up to the north NVA headquarters areas uh, about what was going to happen or what was going on or who was doing what. And he had kept them in loop uh, before we even kicked off Lomson. We used to joke sometimes in the club at night, trying to relax, that these guys seem to know <laughs> more about what's going on over there than we do. Mm. And uh, little did we know at the time, uh, and it didn't come out till years later, uh, that this guy was feeding them some information. He, he, uh, he survived the war. He was, he was a hero in North Vietnam at the time, or after the war. And I think he helped collaborate uh, on the writing of a book about it. And I don't remember the name of the book, but uh, it's a, it, that, that actually happened. Was um, an ending, you don't let the, the character, um, you, let, you allow the character to survive and at least come back and have a, a you know, happy ending, meeting his wife and, and all of that. Um, but there is just so much that I think guys who have served in especially the current war could take away from this of good. Um, and then those who are just wanting to understand about aviation during Vietnam can take away as well. I want to, um, I know we could probably keep on talking for about three more hours because we've been at it almost uh, uh, two hours now, Jeez. believe it or not. Yeah. And, but that's fine. Cause I, I, I probably will have you back so we can talk about some more stuff. Cause I think there's some other additional things I want to get into, but I do want to make sure that before we leave, where can people find this book? Well, there's a couple ways. Uh, one, I would encourage you to go to my website, 
It's uh, lowercase larryfreeland.com. If you go to that, you'll uh, see a little bit about the book. You'll see a little bit about um, my history, if you will. But more importantly, you'll, you'll see a bunch of the reviews on one of the drop downs. And I'm uh, very proud of it. There's a lot of reviews, a lot of articles. Um, uh, I'm up for author of the year in Georgia for 2022, uh, which is a real honor. I'll know something in June. Even being nominated was great. But if you go to my website, you'll be able to get a little background on the book and everything. Uh, and then at the, where you sit by the book, there's a icon you hit, and it brings up five sites. Uh, there's uh, Books a Million, there's uh, which is BAM, and then the big one is uh, Amazon mm-hmm. and Barnes and Noble and Indie, and there's one other, and I can't for the life of me remember the name of. But there's these five different uh, websites you can go to. I don't get any more money for that. It's just easier. It brings you right into the site with my book, and you see everything, and you can order from that. Or you could go to your local bookstore and have them ordered if you want to support your bookstore. Uh, either way, you can do it. And it's in, uh, it's on all the ebook platforms, and it's uh, in uh, paperback. I really enjoyed reading this book, and um, I also enjoyed reading the comments from individuals. Very, um, a lot of them were. Um, that I read were Vietnam pilots or infantrymen who talked about how legitimate the stories are inside the book. And I'm sure for you, that's, you know, that's a, that's a big time thing to take away. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But you're a very humble guy. So I want to read something about, um, your background because I don't think that you've really, um, expressed a lot about who maybe, you know, you are now and stuff, or uh, the some of the awards that you got then. I think I wrote them, or I think I tried to type them all down. Let me see if I can find every one of them. Let's see, you, um, you're a recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross with one oak leaf cluster, the Air Medal with 10 oak leaf clusters, the Bronze Star, and various other uh, military service medals. And these are awards that, th- these these are not, these are big time awards, Larry, that, you know, in, in the book, you you probably are very much like the character where you just say, that's not something, you know, I want to put out there and everything. But it was very clear to your family when they saw when you, you know, or at least the character, and I'm assuming it's the same, when you came back and they saw it, just what you experienced. Yeah, my you know? parents, well, it's that's that part's basically true. It's uh, when I landed and uh, <clears throat> it was December there in uh, Panama City, it was cold, and I came down the steps and met my family on the apron out there and I had all my khakis and I had on my flight jacket uh, and we went inside and warmed up and I unzipped it and my dad was retired then but you know dad was a full colonel in the Air Force and uh, been in three wars so he he saw that and he, he broke down yeah yeah understandably so and if I make and I plug my new book real quick yeah yeah absolutely that's right I forgot about that always the marketing my wife's sitting over there looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, I had another storyline in mind. I only take a minute. Yeah. I had another storyline in mind that had been in the back of mind for a good while, and that was uh, uh, writing a, uh, what I turned it, determined to do, uh, a, a trilogy. Uh, and it would follow a, a family, American family of three generations of men that fight in all our wars and conflicts up to the present. It'll start in World War I with what I call the patriarch. And uh, book two will cover his son, who fights in, uh, in uh, he'd be an aviator and be in uh, World War II, Korea, and the Cold War. And then he'll have a couple sons that'll be about book three, and they'll be start with the Vietnam and all the other conflicts we had. See, I, both my brothers served. My middle brother was a Navy pilot for 27 years, retired as a captain. My younger brother, he went over three times, twice to uh, Afghanistan, no, Iraq. I got that right. Iraq is where we went in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Iraq uh, twice, 18 months each time with six months between deployments. But he did it on his own as a civilian contractor. He spent all his time on FOBs. He was an explosive expert and a linguistic guy. Okay. And he just liked to shoot guns. We used to call him Tom and I, my middle brother, used to call him Rambo. But he did two tours there in the forward bases with uh, a different infantry. Unit. And then he came back for a while and he went over to Afghanistan for 13 months and did the same thing. So I come from a military family. And I wanted to, in book three, I wanted to cover some of the stories that I know about and the incidents I know about. I think the average person would probably be shocked if they really heard some of those things. Uh, so, but book one, uh, I, I outlined the whole thing. I designed uh, some characters, if you will. And uh, then I approached my publisher, 
early last year while we were getting ready to start pub, or put this out and market it. And he said, yeah, that's not like a good idea, Larry. He says, uh, you know, write your first book. We'll sit down and see what, what we got. So I worked on that uh, throughout the year. And to make a long story short, we just finished editing that, uh, the intense part of the process uh, this past week. So we're shooting to have it out by uh, uh, sometime in June or July. Okay. And book one is uh, called, well, the, the, over, the overall title is uh, Legacy of Honor is the title. And then the subtitle of book one is The Patriarch. And the main character there will be a World War I doughboy. And, um, you know, he'll, 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 he'll be living like this fellow, <laughs> except in the trenches. But, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a love story there. And, there's a, and what I wanted to do in all three books, and that's where I was headed with this, is how do the people adjust, how do veterans adjust after the conflicts, mm. after they get out, or how are they received, how are they treated? And my book one is about 60% uh, in France during the war and in, in an ending. The forty percent is him back with his new wife and trying to adjust and the things he he had to put up with and deal with and the people that have read it just go oh my god and living in the trenches was bad but when I can't believe that what they had to endure when they came back and this is true yeah this is all based in historical fact uh, which some of that and I I know a little bit about World War One but not the extent that I learned and it's just uh, I think it's going to be hopefully it's going to be a good book. Book two will be, you know, so on. I'm starting to research on that, and then book three. But anyway, that'll be coming. Book one will be coming out uh, June or July, and hope it does well. So does that mean, uh, can I reserve the right then to have you back to talk about that? Absolutely. I'm enjoying this, and I'm sure it's going to help. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that would be tremendous. And, of course, um, the fact that you're telling stories from the perspective of the eyes who saw them, whether it's yourself, your brothers, your father, your grandfather, and, and in a way, I'm a genealogist. Uh, I like to do a lot of genealogy in my own family. And so I when I, when I started researching about my ancestors, it, it starts telling the story of their trials and tribulations and resiliency and everything else that led me to me being here. And, and that's fascinating. And so you're now doing that with your grandfather or did to create the first book and you're going to do it uh, further on thereafter. And that's, that's fascinating to me as well. So I, I look forward to you coming back so we can talk more about that. It'll be a historical fiction, but based in a lot of, you know, stories and fact. One more quick question, one yeah. more quick thing that I, I think is pretty cool, and a lot of people I've mentioned it to think so too, that, and that is that when my dad was deployed, I was in the fifth grade, he was deployed uh, to uh, Greena for 13 months, and uh, we lived with my grandparents in Louisville, Ohio, outside of Canton, and my granddad uh, was a big poker player, and he was uh, in the community, a small community, but he, he had several friends and they were all doughboys. They didn't have to fight together, but they were all in France and served in the trenches. And they had a, a poker club and they played once, sometimes twice a month on a Saturday night. And they'd play at the, on the second floor of the courthouse, which was on the first floor was the courthouse, the fire station and the police station. And on the second floor was the records and the big room where they could all socialize and play guards and, and have uh, parties, whatever they did. And firemen would sleep in a corner. And occasionally, Granddad would uh, take me with him for his Saturday night poker games. And we'd you know, have dinner, and we'd walk down there, whatever it was, it was dark, and only a couple blocks from his house, and go up there. And, of course, the guys got to know me, and, uh, and they had food, and they, had, they, would, they would play poker, and they'd talk, and they would drink a little bit, and they'd smoke. They all smoked pipes, at least these guys all did. And uh, I would sit over there on the couch and drink their Cokes and eat their food and watch a little, a little telly over there somewhere. At some point, I'd pass out, you know, all asleep. And granddad would you know, come over, check on me, and cover me and all that. <clears throat> and the next morning, they'd play all night. The next morning, he'd wake me up about 5, 6 in the morning when the sun was coming up. I said, okay, Larry, we're going back now. So he'd wake me up, and we'd walk to the local cafe, have breakfast, and then walk on home. And invariably, grandma and his wife would just jump all over him for keeping me out all night. <laughs> but the point of the story was, at times, well into the night or into the early morning, these fellows would start every once in a while talking about their experience, shared experiences. And opening stuff. up. Yeah. Opening up. And I'd be laying over there on the couch with my back to them, and I would hear some of this. Mm. And at the time, I'd just hear these things, and they just, you know, I'm a little boy, and I was fascinated by, by not war, but I was fascinated by men who served and, yeah. and, and the code and the th all those things that make them men. Uh, and um, so I would listen. And then, you know, years later, it'd come back when I 
serving myself and I can relate a little more to some of those stories. But I drew on some of those stories to help oh, me Oh, within write, the new book. Within the new book. And I dedicate it to my granddad and the men who served. Wow. And I tell that little story in an acknowledgement. So I thought that was pretty cool. No, that is really cool because then it puts a personal, personal element to the stories and stuff that, um, and I think that's what I enjoyed about this is that I, I knew from reading it that there were fiction, but yet truth within it. And I had to ask you to make sure, but um, I know a lot of guys who have done that type of stuff when writing the book, just because they didn't want to have to go through all the checks and balances that have to occur. And it also allowed them to maybe like you did relate other people's stories within it. So it's not an autobiography type of thing, you know, they can really share, um, what other people experienced in through the single character or through characters of the book uh, that that person interacted with, you know, and, and it may have not have been shared that exact same way in real life, but you're able to put it together and make a story out of it where it seems like a fine, you know, stream of stories and from a single character. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted people who read it to <clears throat> come out the other end and say, huh? Well, I had no idea. I've, I've been to Vietnam as a pilot. And I just you know, feel like they have been, and they feel they feel everything that uh, TJ felt and experienced, and his emotions and all the other things that go with it. But uh, I've had so many people tell me that, and all I can say is I accomplished what I was trying that's, to start out. That's right. That's why I wanted to let you know. Mm -hmm. And again. Um, Chariots in the Sky and Larry Freeland, go out there, go to his website, pick up the book, and you won't be disappointed. Thanks so much again, Larry, for coming on the show. Look forward to the next time we do it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah.